Yeah. Let me get there. Yep. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, hold on one second. Recording in progress. Okay. If, let's get the ball rolling. Ah, then. Just in time. <laughs> This will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood CSD Board of Directors. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial in information printed on this agenda. At points in the meeting when the meeting chair requests public comment, Members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. Now that that's out of the way, uh, it's call uh, roll call. President Shea? Um, here. Director Case? Here. Thank you. Director Kilkenny? Here. Director Oyserman? Here. Director Ruggieri? Here. Thanks. Okay, does anybody have any changes for the agenda? So. In that case, let's adopt the agenda as is. And the first thing coming up is our no, I, it appears to be a monthly uh, housekeeping feature given to us by our legislators in, for, in, Sacramento. in Sacramento. So we have resolution 2021-10, making findings and confirming the need to continue conducting remote meetings via telephone, teleconference of the Board of Directors, Fire Commission, and Park and Recreation Commission. We need to approve this. Do I hear a motion? I motion to approve the resolution number 2021-10, making the, uh, us making the findings confirming our need to continue conducting remote meetings by a teleconference for the board of directors of CSD, the fire commission and parks and recreation commissions. Second. Cool. Any comments? To, was I supposed to say for the month of, okay. You're sorry. good. You're okay. good. Any comments? Do we have any public comments? Yeah. One second, Bill. Hello? Yes, yes Stephen. Stephen. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, well, uh, thanks for letting me speak to this. Um, I just wanted to say that I actually like uh, the remote meetings. However, I'm questioning um, whether we really need to do it um, since we are mass mandates off. Uh, you know, we're, we're in one of the most vaxxed counties in the country. Um, I just question that. Um, my concern is not for my participation. Quite frankly, I like, um, uh, I like sitting at home instead of going over there. But um, I do think uh, you guys need to be accessible to people who have the need to speak to you in person. And, um, you know, uh, we're not a secret body here. We're a public body. So I, I do think there needs to be a public meeting or some way that the, uh, the public can maybe even come in uh, and, and sit next to Eric or something like that um, so they can participate. Not everybody, some people are intimidated by Zoom and I, I think you should take that into account. Anyhow, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. <coughs> Anybody, Anybody else, sir? No, sir. All righty. Let's get a vote going. Board President Shea? Aye. Director Case? Aye. Director Kilkenny? Aye. Director Oyserman? Aye. And Director Ruggieri? Aye. 
Cool. Thank you. Uh, up next is a consent calendar. We have to approve the draft minutes of the regular meeting of October 12th and the bills paid. Any questions? I'm hearing none. Any questions from the public? Yes, sir. One second, please. <clears throat> Stephen. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, uh, this is from the minutes from the last meeting. As you know, I wasn't there. You had a record uh, short meeting. I'm, I'm sure you guys were all thrilled about that. Um, but I was fine and there was no problem. Um, but um, I did have a question because last month you did uh, make a payment to Bill Hansel for about 13,000, uh, I guess 13,500, I, I forget how much it was. But it just so it happens that was a portion of the bill and the entire amount that um, it was estimated by our general manager that Bill Hansel's services had cost. So now we're, we're way beyond that initial estimate where everything is just blown uh, through the roof as far as uh, budget on that project. And uh, I just want to bring that to attention. I did watch the tape. None of you question it. And well, actually, no, I, I should take that back. I, uh, Bill questioned it. Um, but I do think uh, uh, at least we should be hearing from our general manager uh, what's going on uh, as far as uh, the financial performance and uh, uh, the objectives he initially set out uh, for our community for this project. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Anybody else, Eric? No, sir. All right. I need uh, a motion and a second. Anybody? I move to approve the consent calendar, including the draft minutes of the regular meeting of October 12, 2021, and bills paid numbers 58846 to 5906. Second. Thank you. Thank you. How about a vote, Tiff? President Shea? Aye. Director Case? Aye. Director Kilkenny? Aye. Director Oyserman? Aye. And Director Ruggieri? Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next is public comment, open times not on the agenda. Do I have any public comments? Yes, one, one second though. Stephen. Yes, uh, so is a question for each one of you. Um, why are you serving on the board? Um, hopefully it's uh, because you have a positive vision for our community. Um, uh, we have great examples in our community. Uh, uh, Chris's uh, dad um, uh, is one of those people uh, in our community that shaped uh, what Marinwood is today. Um, uh, the people that bought open space shaped what Marinwood is today. The people that uh, voted on the pool and, and the rec programs uh, uh, were the ones that uh, helped shape the vision for our community. And we have a lovely community. We, we all love, love our community. But what's your vision? Um, I have been an observer and participant in these meetings for uh, a long time. And while you've heard a lot of criticism I have of staff, uh, it really is not so much the staff, it's really the board who I critique because as members of the board, you're not unlike uh, 
the board of directors for a corporation. You set the vision, you set the path, you hold our staff accountable uh, to those goals. And um, too often we, you know, I think people want to get along and they just listen to the staff and there's a lack of rigor uh, on, you know, hey, how are we doing towards our goals? I, actually, I, I hardly ever hear that. Uh, I ha hardly ever hear, uh, we hardly ever get written reports from our staff. Um, a lot of verbal reports, uh, a lot of what I would call boilerplate reports, but in terms of analysis and uh, growth towards a goal, I really think uh, the board can do a better job of holding our staff accountable. Um, so we're going to be talking about profit and loss. That's a marker, um, but uh, there are other goals as well for our community, and I hope uh, you find ways to to actualize the vision that that motivates you for our community. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anybody else? Eric? No, sir. Okie dokie. On to district matters. Uh, fiscal year 2021-22, first quarter, P&L. Eric. Yeah, sure. I gave you guys a, a detailed report in here, written uh, report. So uh, to go over it really quickly, and I'm not going to read it line for line, but in looking at it, uh, you know, in reviewing what this report is, and I'm pretty sure everybody is, remembers these from last fiscal year as well. Uh, this is a report comparing our current revenues and expenditures to our what was set as budget goals as it was approved last May. Um, I do, you know, certainly want to point out and kind of go over that even though the year is 25% over, uh, that certainly does not mean that we should be at or near the 25% mark for each of these line items. In fact, for the vast majority of them, uh, we are not, especially due to the seasonality of the of the business that we're in um, and everything else, as well as our revenues. Uh, so uh, we have reviewed Q1 financials. They do fall in line with what we expected them to be at this point in time. Uh, and in some places have actually exceeded our expectations on the revenue side. So we feel good about that. Um, as always, you know, primary cost drivers in a service-based uh, agency such as ours or, you know, staff wages and benefits, uh, as well as a lot of annual one-time payments that we tend to make at the beginning of the fiscal year. These include our insurance payments, our unfunded accrued liability payment into pension as well as some of our other memberships and dues that always get paid one time towards the beginning of the year. Um, as of October 31st, the cash balance is stated in here in our general treasury fund is approximately 4.7 million. Um, However, it should be noted, and I included in my written report here, that uh, restricted funds do make up 727,000 of that 4.07 million. Those restricted funds are approximately 107,000 uh, designated for the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority that we are a uh, participating agency in, as well as the $620,000 instruction loan that we took out for the maintenance facility. Um, after you factor all that in, our cash balance is actually at about unrestricted 3.34 million. Um, this is actually an increase of about $830,000 from this same point in time last year. So even with pandemic and reduced programming and services, um, we are still maintaining a, a good level of revenue over expenditure, um, which is exactly what that represents. Uh, also gave you a couple other quick notes from more of a balance sheet perspective as of September 30th, um, otherwise, you know, quarter end, uh, our OPEB trust fund had a balance of just under $470,000 in it, which is really good considering we just started that fiscal year 17, 18, and uh, we have contributed $385,000 in cash holdings into that trust and realized just under $84,000 in interest uh, earnings in that. So, or I should say investment earnings, sorry. Um, looking forward to quarter two, uh, that's when we start to realize a lot of our uh, 
tax revenues, 55% of our general property ad valorem taxes start to be allocated into our fund, as well as 55% of our special taxes. Um, and again, just to reiterate, you know, we've certainly analyzed and went through these, sat down, made sure we didn't have any significant concerns, which we do not. Uh, we're trending right where we expected to be trending. That said, we'll continue to you know, keep a diligent eye and watch on the financials as we move through the fiscal year. Any questions, I am happy to answer them. Um, I did leave a, a page at the end of the report that uh, kind of goes over some significant uh, uh, items of note in terms of uh, any summary or variance notes. You know, Eric, what I saw, <clears throat> what I'm curious about is the overtime pay for the fire department. Sure. We have 116 paid out already and just 100 for budget. Is that just for the quarter? The that 100, is 100,000 budget? That is for, no, the 100,000 is kind of just a benchmark that we've always put in there. It really okay. probably should go up uh, in future years because we exceed it pretty good. Um, a couple mm -hmm. things to keep in mind on that, though, uh, that does include a, a strike assignment that we went out on for a full two weeks uh, with one of our people and all the backfill. And we've also had a long-term industrial injury that we've had to backfill for yeah. as well. So... Uh, Naturally, overtime is a little bit higher than it would tread normally. Um, obviously, the strike team assignment is reimbursable. Uh, that usually doesn't happen until towards the end of the fiscal year. Um, but with the industrial injury that has been ongoing now, that means every third shift, you know, at, at, yeah. at, 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 at every six days, two of those days have to be filled with an overtime. Plus, then you also have people that are out sick or on vacation or whatever the case may be. And all that gets back filled it. with OT as well. Okay. That's all I had. It stuck out for some reason. Anybody else? Uh, hearing nothing. Uh, anything from the public? Sure, one second, please. Steven. Yes, uh, it's great to uh, receive these uh, P&L statements, Eric, and I think that's something that, uh, I don't know if you, I think you might have introduced it, but anyhow, it is, it is helpful, and, and when I'm talking about, uh, you know, measurable uh, uh, results, uh, uh, this is the kind of stuff that I think is important. But it's actually meaningless unless it's uh, placed against the backdrop of the goals for the district. Um, you know, for example, I, I, I guess we're going to talk about it later, uh, the pool revenues. But, um, you know, how well are we serving the public? You know, what sectors of the public are we serving? How many of the people that, um, you know, come through our camps, uh, use our facilities, how many of them are actual uh, taxpayers or uh, residents of the district. Um, we don't really get that information. Um, if you have goals, uh, directors, such as improving our parks and open space and play structures and rec departments, etc., you know, how, how are these uh, uh, P&L statements, uh, what, what are they telling you about uh, achieving those goals? Um, we don't know because that's not something that the board um, spends time with. But I, I urge you to spend time with that because you're creating the Marinwood CSD of tomorrow. It's you. Thank you. Anybody else, Eric? No. Okay. <clears throat> On to <clears throat> more housekeeping. We need to approve resolution 2021-11. Fixing the employer contribution for employees and annuitants under the Public Employees Medical and Hospital Care Act. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is an annual item. So we uh, have policy in place that states that the district will pay set percentages of the Kaiser premium. 
uh, our health care is provided through CalPERS, through the Public Employees Medical, uh, Medical and Hospital Care Act. They set the rates that are effective every January for the upcoming calendar year. Um, as which, when those change, we need to change our employer contributions that, again, go within the percentages of the Kaiser uh, premium for our region. Uh, this simply sets that so it maintains our employer contributions at those same set percentages for both the miscellaneous classification and the safety classification. This does apply to both retirees as well as uh, active employees and would become effective January 1st. And we do this every single year. Every year they change the rate. You are yep. correct. There was one year that they didn't change the rate, so we didn't have to do it, but that okay. was for a different reason. All right. Any questions? Hearing nothing. I have one. Okay. Do they pay yeah. the benefits or do they pay a portion? I'm sorry? Do we cover their benefits or do they pay a portion? I'm sorry, who is they? The employees. Oh, yeah. Uh, they all pay a portion. So, uh, okay. so yeah, they pay, they pay a portion. The district covers 90% of the premium for miscellaneous employees and 80% of the premium. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Just confirming it's always been that way, right? Correct. As long as I've been here. Anything from the public? I do not have any raised hands right now, Bill. All right. I need a motion in a second. All motion to approve the resolution number 202111, fixing the employer contribution under the Public Employees Medical and Hospital Care Act at equitable amounts or at an equal amount for employees and annuities. I will second that. Awesome. Tiffany? Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. And on to the, thank you, on to the district manager's report. Uh, good. Thanks, Bill. I'm going to take these kind of out of order from what I have in there. Uh, a very quick update just on the Miller Creek uh, Trail going along the waterway that we discussed a couple of meetings ago. I do have an agreement in place with a local, uh, not local, but a uh, semi-local uh, trail design professional. We've worked with this individual in the past. He's done a lot of work with the Open Space District. Uh, I am hoping to, uh, he's hoping to actually be able to do some field work this week. Um, weather and allowing and hopefully by late November early December we have a, a, an initial kind of feasibility study from him uh, looking at his professional opinion on putting a trail in this select area again that area is running uh, along Miller Creek waterway uh, from Las Galinas Road across from where the mini park is located all the way down to what eventually would be a new roadway leading to the proposed senior facility um, so once I am able to get that report and we are able to have that finalized, we'll bring that back in front of the board for further discussion. Um, uh, I did, uh, there was a request last month for some updates on the park maintenance facility. So I tried to give you some, uh, some detail on the progress there. Everything is still moving. The uh, one note uh, uh, right now is our lead time has been pushed out pretty far on the windows that we need. Uh, so that is pushing it back, but our, our, Builder is able to adjust accordingly, and he's been very uh, good with that. Haven't lost any time really due to the weather. Um, and I did try to include some pictures on the following page, just kind of showing everybody what the progress was and the dates of those. So hopefully those came through and can be seen good. I will say they finished up all of the uh, plywood roofing already and were able to tarp it before this latest rain. Um, but again, they're not, uh, the rain hasn't really been pushing them uh, back or slowing progress all that much. They're able to shift to other items. Um, and then finally, just a uh, update on some of our fire prevention, uh, uh, vegetation management work that is happening. 
Um, we've actually uh, got the work started. All of the environmental work had been completed. And as of last week, we have an excellent crew that is out there doing this work. Uh, I did want to do a brief uh, screen share just so everybody can kind of take a uh, understand where we are working at right now. Um, get rid of this. If you notice, this is the whole area. This is Idleberry Road, um, kind of running all the way down here to Miller Creek Road. Uh, that comes this way, and then this is where Queenstone Fire Road comes in. So all of the area highlighted in yellow uh, within a 100, per, uh, 100 foot uh, zone of what's known as the Wildland Urban Interface is where they are doing the work, removing down and uh, dead uh, trees and foliage, raising the canopy, uh, uh, and doing some slight limbing through there. Uh, primarily exactly in these pockets. It's just under 11 acres worth of work. Uh, again, uh, my, uh, my sincere appreciation to Kate Anderson, who is a vegetation management specialist with San Rafael Fire Department, who really has uh, led this charge and uh, helped out a lot with getting everything done and getting it moving. They expect all of this work to take about three to four weeks in total to be completed. Uh, and again, that's kind of weather allowing on some of it as well. I was actually out there yesterday uh, in some of the parts that they've completed. It looks very good. It's very, very clean. Um, and you wouldn't even really know that they were there except on how much more improved the entire area is starting to look. So we've been getting some nice feedback from a lot of the uh, residents that live in some of these areas too. So they uh, are continuing to work, continuing to push through. And like I said, we expect that uh, to be done in about three to four uh, weeks total time. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, and that's all funded through uh, allocations we received directly from the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. That's it. I think Savan has a question. I don't think I'm allowed to ask questions today. Uh, you're allowed, sorry. <laughs> I just want to make sure that I wasn't interrupting you. So the reason that it's like kind of patchy on the Idleberry side is just that there's portions that have already been taken care of and they see nothing else to do versus the uh, continuous the, one near Queenstone. I'm just assuming that that's what it is and I just want to confirm. No, you have the, you had like up. the little circle. The reason it's patchy here is actually we were just trying to get a better scope on the total uh, area. If, if you notice, and I can kind of try to zoom this in a little bit for you. Um, it's patchy here because this is where the vegetation is. Uh, these other yes, areas, is. these other areas are mostly just, you know, kind of grassland through here, but okay. this is where all the trees and this is the work that they're doing now. The grassland, uh, we actually accomplish through uh, the goat grazing. Yeah. And that's what brings most of that down. So this is okay. just really focusing on the, on the woody areas that are. Yeah, we did that. And we did that just recently too. So. Yeah. And, and this area is, well, very woody. So, uh, and hasn't been done for many years. In fact, I don't, I don't know that we've ever uh, mm -hmm. taken on a project quite of this scope in that mm -hmm. area. So uh, this, is, this is all really good stuff. Super exciting. Hey, Eric, do you know, um, like I just, because of the way my day travels, like going back the east, like toward Miller Creek School, there's the hill. Um, is this ever part of the plan to, to get in and mitigate some of that vegetation in the central part of Marinwood as well? Uh, it, it's a plan eventually for down the line. I mean, this funding is going to carry us for the next nine more years right now. We're really okay. focusing on the much higher priority areas. And in that area, it'd be much more of a shaded fuel break. Uh, you know, so much of that is kind of a northern exposure. There's a large portion of that hill that we don't own. Okay. Um, and one of the other areas, you know, and this isn't all total what we're going to do this year. Um, in the early spring, my, you know, I know Santa Fe is hoping to bring in some more AmeriCorps crews. And we're hoping to get them out to be able to do some, uh, you know, basic broom pulling and things. There's that kind of more meadowy area um, closer to Las Galinas on the eastern side of that hill that kind of runs parallel to Las Galinas all the way down to Ellen Court. Uh, right. That's that's one of the areas that we were looking at. We were also looking at the area that surrounds Elvia Court. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, with that, um, when they broke ground and started all that construction, our primary access got taken away. So we're going to have real access challenges to that area. So we might be pushing that area until they're done with 
the residential development that is happening because that residential development does absolutely include a uh, access easement um, at the end of the road that they're going to be putting in to get into the open space there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Um, and, and just connecting to the follow-up on the construction, I really appreciate that as well. I know that was kind of my ask from last month and um, it looks great. Everything to me looks like it's going along as well as we could possibly hope. Good, I'm glad you appreciate it, thank you. Any more comments? Anything from- One the question. Oh. One. Um, when there's a delay in, let's say there's a delay of the delay in windows, mm -hmm. if there's a change in it, do they go to bill and do we pay bill for that consulting a change? No, that's not a change. I mean, when we do, when change orders do come up, sure, it is certainly something that is discussed amongst myself, the builder and the architect. Mm -hmm. um, the windows is actually a supply chain issue. This isn't a change order. Uh, okay. It's just a matter of materials and being able to get them in. There's a lot of supply chain challenges kind of happening right now uh, for a thousand different types of products and materials. Uh, but yes, yeah, when we have other types of change orders, sure, they need to be approved by our architect. And so we're billed by that. There's no like package that or contract that comes. No, this contract is a time and materials contract. All right. Not, thank a, not you. a percentage. Uh, other, other ones tend to be percentages of total construction cost. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? And then how about the public? Do they have any comments? Uh, sure, one second, Bill. Hi, um, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, first, uh, with regards to the Miller Creek Trail feasibility report, I'm not quite sure why we need to spend $4,500 to uh, have someone tell us that it's infeasible, too expensive, and besides of which, uh, our staff has already indicated that they don't have the expertise and interest in maintaining a trail. The question I really want to understand is, we have thousands of trails throughout Marin and, and, and I don't know, maybe hundreds in, in our open space. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but we have lots. And I don't believe any of them required the studies and uh, engineering and CEQA and all kinds of complications that was, were introduced as reasons why we can't get this project done. Um, I urge the board to hold uh, a vision uh, for a uh, future that includes a Miller Creek Trail uh, throughout our district. I think that is something that uh, could be generational in impact. It doesn't have to be complicated. We could probably get Boy Scouts and volunteers to create much of it, but we need to understand the legalities of it. On to uh, the maintenance uh, facility. Um, you know, in my professional life, uh, whenever you had a complicated project such as this, you would have a project manager who could produce um, uh, detailed reports on uh, goals, mini goals, uh, and performance. And what you're receiving here is, is really, I mean, I honestly, it's just, it's so vague that, that it really makes me concerned that we're going to have huge cost overruns. It doesn't, uh, show to me that, uh, that we're on schedule, that we're on budget, uh, that the quality is what we want. It's just, you know, it's just a, it's just a silly, it's just a silly overview. And so um, I do ask that you uh, hold uh, uh, this project accountable. This is going to be your legacy project too. And if it gets screwed up, it's unfortunately going to be your legacy. So, so I, I think each of you has an interest. The, the vegetation management, I haven't been up to, to see that area. Um, I certainly hope that it's being done with uh, great sensitivity. It sounds like uh, they were working towards that. Um, and I would be interested, uh, I'm also interested in, in uh, the, 
uh, erosion that may be created as a result of removal of all the brush, but I guess we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, but uh, anyhow, I appreciate the report. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Um, on to fire department matters. Draft minutes of the fire commission meeting. We are going to review. Any questions? Hey, Bill, if I could just jump in. I know we discussed this briefly at the last uh, meeting, but uh, one of the things we discussed moving forward was having the board liaisons who do attend all of the fire commission meetings as representatives of the board to just kind of kind of come in and have their comments uh, regarding the respective meetings. I know um, Kathleen Kilkenny is the liaison to the fire commission, attends all the meetings, represents the board in the meetings. Um, so if you wouldn't mind if uh, we wanted to start that this month. Sure. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Um, so let me just start by saying it's, I have the easier part. Sorry, Lisa, because there's a whole report to follow up just in case I forgot something to announce to you guys. <laughs> Um, but the one thing that I do just want to announce is that um, our fire commission was really appreciative of our inspectors going around to all our properties and inspecting the property. And there was a lot of um, residents that started really pulling out their juniperberry bushes and other bushes that could easily, you know, spark and burst more flames. And they're just, our community's showing that they're really understanding the importance of these inspectors and their recommendations. Um, I also announced, and they are in agreement with us to stay remote. Um, they like it as well. So I said, as long as the board decides to stay remote, they will stay remote, um, which we agreed to at the beginning of this meeting. And then the other thing that our, that we discussed was how long it took the review time for the apparatus, I love saying that, um, to go all the way along the ridge. And that was actually quite interesting, but I'm not going to go into it too much because it's in his report as well. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's about it. All right. I missed Chief White has. <laughs> <laughs> so, but thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Questions from the public? Uh, yeah, one second, Bill. Stephen. Oh, okay. Uh, Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so I uh, appreciate the report. I appreciate the uh, 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 anecdotal uh, uh, report uh, from Kathleen. Um, I understand a lot of things get discussed uh, in the fire commission and since they spend half of our budget or more and uh, represent um, uh, a, a long-term li financial liability to the public, I, I do think we need better record keeping. Now, I know uh, Eric is, you know, feels that the current uh, form uh, bare bones form is adequate. I think there could be a compromise here. All he has, we're, since we're recording all these meetings anyhow, all he has to do is uh, save uh, these video uh, meetings and uh, publish them on, up on YouTube. Um, and that will uh, provide us with some uh, kind of record uh, should we need to uh, uh, review what what has gone on uh, in the past and uh, why not I mean we are a public agency uh, why shouldn't uh, there be access when we have the tools and technology uh, to do so uh, very easy um, anyhow but that would be something that the board needs to decide do you Want an accountable room with CSD uh, and fire department or not? I mean, if you do, you, you need to to have some way to to record what's going on. And um, while Kathleen, uh, I, I mean no disrespect to Kathleen, I know she re 
uh, gave her report as best she could. It's really just her interpretation of what went on. There, there might be things that she left out. There might be uh, more that uh, uh, should be discussed. But we're not going to hear it unless there's a record. And uh, why not have a record? So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Steve. I add one thing just to comment on that. Um, the other reason why we added this was so the board, all board members as the fire representative could say, hey, Kathleen, can you bring up this and um, go back to our commission and ask them the question. The other thing that I do wanna add is I do follow up with Eric after our meetings on the thing, a few things that our fire commission brings up as well. So there is accountability in many of our commission meetings. And I just, I feel a little offended right now by saying, by you saying that our board is not holding our staff accountable. So I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Uh, I guess that'll take care of that. The appointment of fire commission, fire commissioners for the term beginning January 1st, 2022. Looks like we have a couple of appointments. Yeah, we do. Um, one of them is a reappointment and another one is a member of the community who is requesting to be appointed for the first time. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out two two items actually with this is um, first off, uh, the reappointment would, on the fire commission would be for a two-year term. These are terms typically last from January through uh, following December of two years later. <clears throat> and they are staggered based on the number of seats. So uh, you do, you know, roughly half the seats one year, roughly half the seats the other year. Um, the other is actually a vacant seat that has been vacant for almost a year now that would be filled. If you look at my recommendation here, what this would do would be to reappoint um, uh, Commissioner Pascal Carcenti to a two-year term in his seat, uh, effective January 1st, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, to appoint um, a gentleman named John Surratt, who is applying and interested to serve. Um, John, as you see in his letter, has a lot of history with the Volunteer Fire Department and the Marinwood Fire Department as well. Um, and he would be filling the vacancy that could actually be filled effective immediately with a term that would end in December of 2022, at which point he could always reapply for a full two-year seat. Right. Yeah, How and with both? this, if uh, both these people are appointed, I would also like to point out that all regular seats would be filled. We would have a vacancy in the alternate seat, but uh, we haven't had uh, the seats all filled in either commission actually for a little while now. So this is nice to have some community. How do we go about doing the appointment? Uh, I would uh, look for a motion to re basically what I typed out there at the bottom under staff recommendation. Yeah, and you don't need to talk about leaving the alternate commission seat vacant. Okay, so a motion to um, direct staff recommendation. Uh, sure, or just read it out to uh, to appoint Pascal Tercente to a regular seat on the fire commission uh, for a two-year term expiring December 2023, uh, and to appoint John Surratt to the currently vacant regular seat on the fire commission effective immediately with a term expiring December 2022. You got that, Bill? Oh, shall I'll we? Second. All right, I'll second that. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I can't actually okay. make the <laughs> right. motion. So. So, uh, well, I didn't know if Bill was starting the motion and you were reading the rest of it for him, if he was unable to do that reading part. But I motion to reappoint Pascal Carcendi to the regular seat on the Fire Commission for a two-year term expiring December 2023 and appoint John Surratt to the current vacancy regular seat on the Fire Commission effective immediately with the term expiring December 2022 and leaving the alternate commissioner seat vacant. I'll second Yay. Do, do we have any comments? Yeah, one sec. Uh, are you looking for the board or for public? Well, I'm assuming the board is going to be okay with these appointments. Uh, I, I would I would just thank these people. I appreciate what they're doing, and it's nice to have people that 
um, both seem to have community interest and also some, uh, some background in this area. I think we're really lucky. Well, and John's been associated for a really long time as the alternate, correct, Eric? Uh, John Surratt? No, he has no. never been. No, okay. That, sorry. Never mind. Okay. I was. Strike okay. that from record, please. Uh, but I agree with Chris. It's nice when people step up and are willing to help and want to be involved. And uh, the commissions are a good way to, to do that on a a little pressure environment. Sure. And they serve as advisory bodies uh, to the board as well as to staff, and they, they are certainly valuable to have. Um, and we appreciate them, so I appreciate Chris's sentiment there. Thank you. Any comments from the public? Yeah, one second, Bill. Steven do is apologize to Kathleen. I think she misunderstood me. I wasn't uh, referring to uh, how she deals with the staff regarding the fire department. Really what I was talking about is, you know, how is this information uh, getting out to the public? Um, these board members, you're going to also do the park uh, board members. You know, the public doesn't know who, who these people are, what they're saying. Um, or how their community is being managed. Um, and really what I'm asking you to do um, is to represent the public. I'm asking the board now to represent the public and make sure that, you know, we know what's going on. Um, I, I assume all these people are, are, you know, good at what they do. Um, but, you know, we all always get secondhand information and we and, and the bare bones report. So we really don't know what's going on. And um, uh, hey, they might be doing a great job. And so it would, should be a good thing to, to know what they're doing. Um, I just think that um, the board really needs to uh, ask themselves, you know, what is the purpose of serving? Uh, what is, I, I, you know, hopefully it's to, to create a better Marinwood um, and uh, a safe, uh, district, a fire safe district, and uh, but we we really don't know now. I, I'm, you know, the chief is about ready to speak, and I I have some questions uh, concerning um, uh, concerning some reports that I had expected from him. Um, but but um, I honestly I, I think the board is is falling down. Um, I I would like to know who these people are. I'd like to see their faces. On our web page, I'd like to see, I'd like to see these meetings published. Why not? What what is the point of keeping them quiet? If they're doing a good job, they should feel proud of their their work, and you should feel proud of 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 of, of backing them up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <sighs> Tiffany, can we have a vote? Please. Sure thing. Board President Shea. Aye. Director sure. Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Thank you all. Now, I'd like to welcome in Chief Darren White. <laughs> well, good evening. Uh, uh, Chief's directors. report. Good evening, District Manager Dreykerson, and good evening, members of the public. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And I'd like to uh, just, before I get started with my report, echo some of the, the comments from Director Case and showing disappreciation for all of you and as all, all of the commission members as well, who week after week, month after month, are here demonstrating your commitment to the community, your commitment to public safety, um, and your willingness to give of yourself, your time, your energy, and your focus on those things that help the community. And so I, I can certainly appreciate that. Um, while I'm not here on a voluntary basis, I do recognize that the time that you spend is valuable time. And I, I just wanted to share that appreciation if I hadn't done so in quite a while. So I also appreciate the, the fact that we have a Mr. Surratt looking to step up and fill um, a role with some background and experience from within the community directly as well. And that's very encouraging. So 
with that, um, just wanted to open with those remarks and then move forward into my report and then um, be more than happy to answer any questions um, from yourselves and or the public once I'm finished. Um, this was a, a relatively light month in the way of activity. And so that's not, not necessarily a bad thing, but there were some notable things that occurred. And so I'll start with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority uh, and Director Brown acknowledging and reporting to um, various individuals uh, throughout the county that MWPA staff truly recognize the magnitude of work and commitment now required to implement the MWPA the vegetation and, and the risk reduction and all the projects and everything associated with that, that everybody's been absorbing with probably very little practice um, in their previous lives until this time. I think what we're doing here in Marin County is, is setting a example for other agencies and other counties and districts to emulate. And so with that, there's a lot of growing pains, but I think we're doing remarkable work as others have indicated, despite the growing pains that we're experiencing, mm -hmm. because there's been that same level of commitment that you're demonstrating from the individuals that have been hired to try to put these projects and work with the um, Environmental Quality Act and other requirements to make sure that these things are done responsibly and but basically are getting done sooner than later. And as we saw with the Lassen fire, which I'll speak on just briefly a little bit later, we've already talked about it last month, those projects really have drawn down risk already. Um, and with that, that's something that very few communities I know of can really speak to. And so this is, I just, I, I wanna put it in, in context for everyone to understand that the work's already underway and the work's being done responsibly and it's being done in a, a very thoughtful and prioritized manner. And so we're very fortunate to have Kate Anderson and Quinn and other staff working with um, District Manager Dreykeson going out and really assessing the things that are happening within the community and what they consider to be the highest priority projects that need to get underway. And so, um, this is exciting for me. I, I come from an organization that, that understand, understood and understands um, the risk involved and has not yet been quite able to put forward that effort on this scale. And so because of that, um, it's, it's different and unique for me to be able to see and witness progress being made. <clears throat> commitment of the community members and those that are working to try to, to draw down risk. And so although we have about nine more years left before we have to renew this, I hope that what everyone will see and recognize is the immense value this has so that it's a continuum for decades to come and that other communities can see the same value we're experiencing here. To that end, um, prescribed fire has been used in some organizations and in some instances it's been problematic because it may not have been used properly. And so there's gonna be a, a conference coming up next week or a panel discussion of sorts where you're gonna have subject matter experts from a variety of fields and speakers from throughout the state who have experiences both good and bad with the use of prescribed fire. And they're gonna have hopefully some sort of, um, uh, how should we say, a white paper or something else coming out of this to help others understand how to do this responsibly. And we know that it's been used uh, successfully in the past and had been for a number of years until maybe about the turn of last century uh, where it was suddenly decided that this was a barbaric way of treating the, the, the land and the vegetation where uh, maybe it's not necessarily barbaric, maybe it's being proactive and being thoughtful so that you don't find yourself in the situation we now find ourselves in year after year. And so that really looking forward to hearing about the, the conference and the uh, outcomes from that conference. Um, the MWPA le website went live on October 19th and all reports are at least at this point, uh, most folks have been pleased with how their interaction has been with the site. And so if you want to know about a project that's taking place in your community, you can go to the site, type in your city, your district, and address, and pull up some information and learn about the current uh, sit stat on those projects. And I think that's huge because now you're getting that information that some members of the public seem to be asking for, even in, on today's uh, session. Where's the information? Well, the information is there, and it's already being provided, and there's not really a need to replicate what's already there and available for everyone one's access. So I, I, would, I would encourage everyone to consider taking the opportunity to just type it in and take a look and see what it's going to yield. And I'm sure as time uh, moves on, more information is going to be found and populated on that website, especially given the commitment they have to increasing their staffing to ensure great information is going out and good uh, data is being input into the system. To that end, 
The annual report was released on the 21st of last month, and it's now located on the website. And from what we understand, that work plan that was submitted for 2021-2022 has been fairly well received. And this may be the model for future work plans, um, given how successful and how, uh, how much praise it's actually receiving right now. So we're doing some of the right things and doing them in the right manner and at the right time. Moving on, COVID, a real big one right now. I'm going to try to push through this one. I know everyone's probably been glued to the television over the last you know, few weeks as um, the CDC and the California Department of Public Health and others have decided on the fate of the Pfizer vaccine uh, when it comes to uh, vaccinating children ages 5 to 11. Uh, that supplements the effort already kind of underway with the vaccination available for uh, teens and um, preteens from ages 12 to 18. And so with that, uh, I was in a rush to try to get my son the, the, the schedule, but I couldn't get it before I left town. I just got back in this morning. Uh, and unfortunately for me, I've got to figure out what I can do after this meeting to see if I can get him scheduled or even with a drop in perhaps sooner than later. He's 10 years old. Um, other children are a bit older, so they're not, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're not affected by this new decision per se. Um, Call your pediatrician's that. office. I'm sorry? Call your pediatrician's office. That's what I did. Uh, yeah, you know, well, nice going. <laughs> you didn't waste any time. You went straight to the source. Well, he's actually got an appointment on um, Thursday morning. So I was thinking about right after that appointment, trying to see whether or not we could work something out. But I'm going to still take a look tonight. So that's great advice. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm hearing that there may be somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half million children in the state of California who may qualify. The pharmacies, the, the pediatricians offices, the HMOs, everyone has been ramping up their effort even prior to the announcement in anticipation of the availability of the vaccination. And from what I understand, in most instances, they're looking at a third of the size of a dose of an adult will be what's administered to the children ages five to 11. And this has been studied and vetted for quite some time now, and I think it's near 100% effective um, from what I understand. And so that's, um, that's huge. That's amazing. Um, let's hope that there's no side effects or anything like the inflammation of the heart and other things that we've been reading about that happen in some rare cases. Um, but that being said, uh, the school districts are starting to become a bit more stringent about this. And some have already gone on record stating that they expect children to be vaccinated this month uh, to be able to return to in-class, in-person uh, school. And some are moving and pushing it further out to next August. They're expecting by next August, children will be able to come to school, whether it's grade school, middle school, or high school, you'll need to be vaccinated or you're gonna have to be a, a candidate for remote learning if it's offered in that school district. So. Stay tuned for that one. That's going to be a very contentious thing. I, I have a feeling, you know, at least um, for some segment of the population moving forward. Um, one of the real pushes right now, I think, is very timely. I, I was hoping it would happen at least sometime last month, if not sooner. They're really pushing to get this done because they anticipate the winter season being one of the normal seasons where we can anticipate more um, children being um, exposed to one another with flu and other germs being passed among them, uh, especially when there's, uh, how should we say, more of a tendency for people to be in close proximity to each other based on the weather, based on um, the time of year, based on it getting dark sooner, all of these other variables. And so with that, um, the timing is great. I, I would hope that we can get you know everyone um, who's going to be vaccinated done before Christmas somehow. You know, we're just getting down to the, the colder months and this could be going on for the next couple of months easy. Um, oh, booster shot, mix and match approval. That's another one that's um, also helpful in the, in the fight to try to vaccinate as many people as possible. It's been now approved that if you've gotten the Johnson & Johnson, you're eligible to get the Pfizer or the um, Moderna vaccine and Likewise, if you've had Moderna or Pfizer, you're able to get a booster with one of the others. They said also that those who took the Johnson & Johnson should consider getting vaccinated with their second dose or booster shot with a second dose, sometimes as soon as I think two to three months after that first dose was issued. But um, they, they, they say that based on their suspicion that, um, or maybe some evidence that the 
the potency starts to wane a little bit after the first several months on the Johnson and Johnson. So, because if you recall, that one was just a single dose vaccination early on. So we'll see what, ha what happens as we move forward with the mix and match, strat mix and match strategy and how that plays out uh, and just how many people make themselves available to getting something else other than what they may have originally received. Um, the last and fire, as uh, Director Kilkenny mentioned earlier, um, we actually did a, a, a uh, just a, a brief walkthrough on some of the timelines on what it took to get from one location to another um, by virtue of some questions uh, that emanated from um, some of the commissioners. And so we actually uh, provided the uh, a, a screenshot. If I think, Eric, are you able to pull that up? Nice. Yeah, let me pull this one second. So while he's doing that, I'll just explain that this was the last and fire area that consumed roughly 44 acres on September 1st. And if you think about it, engine 58 was first on scene and uh, got on scene under six minutes. And that was after being fully dressed and ready to respond. Captain John Papa Nicola was the first in company officer on scene. He uh, established command and made um, the correct initial size up and calls to summon additional resources. And then began a, a progressive hose lay on what we call the right flank of the flyer fire. We'll call that the Zulu flank. Uh, you'll see it now outlined in red where the cursor arrow is. So the point of origin is back down low, close to structures, which could have been threatened easily. They moved forward and started to flank that fire um, on the right side, where they, they thought things were given wind conditions, pushing things uh, rapidly in that direction. And then they established the, the left flank, which is the Bravo side of the fire. Um, Given that, you know, very steep terrain, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of vegetation there. The need for additional resources became apparent immediately given what they were exposed to and what they saw initially on scene. And so um, a, lot of a lot of credit goes to, to Captain Papa Nicola and our crews for just taking and making the right decisions early on. I understand there was a little bit of frustration about, you know, why so many other areas were under evacuation. But as I explained before, I'd much rather err on the side of being overly cautious than not cautious enough when it comes to an event such as a wildfire because things can change rapidly for any number of reasons, whether it's the fuel, the wind direction, embers flying, different things that contribute to the situation um, changing suddenly. And so I just wanted to make that clear that although the initial evacuation was maybe a bit excessive, um, it was also an opportunity for individuals to practice evacuation, which we don't very much see a lot of opportunities to do that. And it was a, a practice with an actual incident as opposed to a simulation. So there's, there's an element of realism there that you won't get uh, if you're just doing a simulation. Um, that being said, there's also the x-ray and mic points of the fire along the Queenstone Fire Road. And so one of the commissioners had the questions before, uh, question last month about what exactly does it take for, how much time does it take for an individual to get from one point on the fire road to another? And that really depends on a lot of things. It depends on the condition of the fire road. It de depends on whether or not there's debris, uh, fallen trees, logs, anything else that could obstruct the type three or type six apparatus from moving freely in those areas. Fortunately for us, um, there's been you know, excellent work done on ensuring those fire roads are in condition and ready to do exactly what they were intended to do on this fire, which was create opportunities for units to get placed in, and put in place and to supplement the efforts of CAL FIRE, who brought in aerial units to really put a good knock on the fire and stop some of its forward progress. But if you take a look at the blue pins that are on the screen that um, is before you, you can see the travel times. And so I'm gonna just um, run down the list of travel times for you at this point. And this is from moving west from Queenstone Fire Road Gate. So if you look at the first division X-ray, um, takes eight and a half minutes to get there from that Fire Road Gate. So moving west, eight minutes, 30 seconds. Two more minutes to get over to division Mike, which was at the upper top left of that parallelogram, if you can kind of call it that anyway. Um, 
intersection to Chicken Shack Fire Road. I don't know how that name got named, but it, it's quite a name. Uh, there must be a story behind that. I'd like to know it one day if someone could tell me, but um, I'm assuming there had to be a chicken shack somewhere in the neighborhood at some point there, but 15 minutes and 30 seconds. That's it's quite a haul, but if you look at the distance that you're traveling to get from Division Mike to the chicken shack, that's five minutes, and it's actually um, not a bad amount of time considering the amount of distance you, you had to travel in very unusual um, and probably steep terrain as well. Moving forward west from there to Louise Fire Road, another nearly six minutes to get to that location. As I pointed out earlier, just below the word intersection next to intersection to Chicken Shack, there appears to be a significant dip in the road right there, that V, mm. that, that I would think to some degree might be a harrowing dip for apparatus to traverse and then find themselves going back around. But again, I haven't been in that terrain, so I can't say, but it caught my attention as I look at this. Um, first H Ranch Gate, another two plus minutes to get to that next point. And that's a total of 23, excuse me, 21, 23 minutes and 35 seconds versus 21 minutes and 20 seconds. Big Rock Towers, even further west with a lot more um, open space, or should we say uh, less foliage right adjacent to the fire road, but still the terrain itself challenging enough that it's gonna take almost 10 more minutes to get there. So this, this isn't stuff we can really take for granted. You know, if we had a fast moving fire in this area, the fire road may not be something that apparatus would wanna actually, you know, try to do to get put in place there, just depending on whether or not they could be effective and whether or not there's, you know, structures being threatened or anything else that we think would really make sense for crews to be there as opposed to putting aerial units at play, much like Cal Fire had did, or excuse me, had done. And then last but not least, past the Big Rock Towers, 33 minutes, and then 35 minutes to the second H Ranch Gate. And so if you look at that, that's quite a bit of a, a distance to travel um, I can't give you the actual estimated, you know, miles per hour that they were traveling, but I can assume that they were trying to travel as fast as they could just to make it realistic. So that's a rough guesstimation there. Just wanted you to be aware of that. Two weeks ago on Sunday, we had uh, their first atmospheric river and bomb cyclone strike Marin County and cause a lot of flooding, uh, a lot of uh, fallen trees, uh, down power lines, stranded motorists. Um, some medical calls, some vehicle accidents, definitely some power outages and a lot of calls for assistance. And so Engine 58, as an example, responded to 16 calls during the bomb cyclone event itself. Um, overall, I think just between San Rafael and, and um, Marinwood, there was roughly 130 calls when maybe there would have normally been about 30 calls during that same period of time. And so it just kind of shows you that um, that weather event really kind of put everything on notice for everyone about flooding and all the other things that I had been hearing about, but never had witnessed here on this side of the bay. So it's uh, certainly something for us to, to take note of and be a little better prepared for as we move forward with sandbags and or situational awareness. Um, uh, unfortunately, just prior to that incident, most of the calls were not in the specifically in the Marin Wood area, right, Eric? We didn't have any severe flooding in the Marin Wood area, did we? Uh, I can't tell you where most of the calls were, but it, no, we did not have any significant flooding in Marin Wood. Sorry. Is that, no, but, is that true, Chief, that most of the calls weren't like, yeah, sorry. There, were, there were vehicle accidents, some with injuries, some without. Um, okay. They assisted probably in other districts as those units were being pulled to respond to areas that, you know, they probably definitely did have flooding as an example. So they were now being pulled in out of just Marinwood to supplement San Rafael, but also responding to calls in San, uh, Marinwood as well. Yep. Um, oh, uh, yeah, the engine overheated uh, a couple of days before that. And unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, actually, they, they were able to use the type three apparatus. Um, but the mechanic that has been responsible for um, performing all the work on our San Rafael and, and Marinwood apparatus uh, was hospitalized for a short period of time. And so it just 
I had already been in conversation with the Department of Public Works at San Rafael about trying to build some redundancy to ensure that we had more internal personnel capable of, of performing work other than just the sole individual that we've had for the last few years. And much to my surprise and, and, and joy, there are a couple of individuals that are certainly interested in trying to take on that training and learn more about diesel uh, engines as well as working specifically on our apparatus. So, um, the other plan behind that is, is, is functional, but not a sustainable plan. Uh, and that would have been to use Diego truck repair or maybe some other agency to come in and provide assistance. But that is, to me, that should be a secondary consideration, an alternate behind us having enough staff that can work on our stuff. Um, so more effort, more information to come on that. We will have some more redundancy built in. So hopefully our apparatus won't find itself down and we're relying just on the type three because the reality of it is if that type three was deployed on a strike team, that would now not, we would not have an option except to pull out another resource and put it in play from perhaps San Rafael or another agency. And so just don't want to see us get drawn down that far. And that's what I wanted to share with the group. Um, well, last but not least, um, um, after the storm, some of the crews drove up and down the fire road to assess the assess, uh, assess uh, to assess, say that quickly, assess its accessibility. Please, somebody try when we're off, then when we're done. I shouldn't have wrote it that way. Ac <laughs> assess its accessibility. Wow, that's quite a mouthful. So at any rate, um, they located a couple of downed trees after that storm. So with that, I'm glad that they um, had the, the, the presence of mind to go back out and take a look and see, hey, are we going to have a problem if we have another incident sometime in the near future. So those things are being ad uh, addressed right now. They did cut some of what they could themselves, but there's some other work that still needs to be done in that area. Month of October, 105 calls um, through the 21st, uh, or excuse me, through the 26th of the month. Um, uh, we have a, another individual coming online or just started with us for um, San Rafael. He's a management analyst. And I'm going to be utilizing him for much of the same stuff that I've had in the way of getting data and information back to myself, such as this type of report, the monthly statistics. But I also want to draw deeper into some other things. And so I'm going to have the benefit of that management analyst who has budgeting background, who has the data analytics, back, analytics background, and other key things that I think we'll be able to find a value um, in the way of community outreach and also kind of just presenting graphs and information to make it simple and easy to understand. So I want to be able to share that with our personnel um, at Engine 58 as an example, just so they can see and understand and learn some things that haven't always been available to them um, in the way of just getting a snapshot of what's going on, how and why, so they have a better understanding and feel more informed. But with that, um, our average response time, five minutes, 49 seconds. I tell you, those numbers almost look the same every month. I got to say it again. So, but it's an, again, a, a great testament to how quickly they're getting out. They're always sub six minutes. And that's, to me, that's maybe, phenomenal. Maybe the data person can analyze this and let us know why. You know what? <laughs> uh, I'm sure that's going to be the case. He's very analytical in that way. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he can. And maybe he's found that these are over, you know, over time. Maybe they're five minutes, 20 seconds on average. We'll see, huh? So with that, um, that concludes my report. And if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to, to speak to those. Thanks, Chief. Anybody? I'm like the question queen tonight. Um, I have one. You, they meant, you mentioned the down trees, and maybe this also goes to Luke. Um, then does our maintenance crew go up and clear those? And then um, do they also you know, drive along the road to make sure there's no other down trees? Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak first and then Luke can chime in, but I, I thought this would be something we would put more of a MWPA type effort towards. Um, since we have the personnel, we have the crews that are doing the type of work, it may be a natural thing to actually just have them come over and do that as one small little effort in, in conjunction with everything else they're doing. But that being said, let's say there's no NWPA, I would certainly now look at, you know, what will we have in the way of public works or parks and rec staff that could come out and provide assistance. I can't hear you. 
No, you're not muted. We just can't hear you. I could. No, I didn't hear him. I couldn't. No. No. Really? I don't know how you're hearing him, Bill. Bill's the Luke whisperer. All right, who who can lip read? <laughs> can you guys hear me now? Yay! <laughs> am, I, am I good? Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so yeah, the um, we get reports usually on if it's up in the fire roads. Usually we would get something from a, a hiker or a biker um, alerting us to a hazard or if as a tree has come down over the path. Um, we do monitor the open space, but. Um, you know, not as regularly as people are out there doing their morning their morning jogs and things. So we will go address something if we get a report. Uh, we do work closely with our fire department, and you know if, if they're better suited to get up there, or if we'll, sometimes we'll go up there together and tackle um, something that's on on a fire road or something. So um, it kind of depends. We we do a case by case, and we do uh, keep in, in close communication with uh, with the fire um, crew and you know whoever's best situated to go deal with it. We'll we'll work like that. So maybe this is another option of giving it to the fire protection agency too, like Chief White suggested, if time permits. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, we're a, a step ahead and I can chime in on this a little bit. So in something like this, where we just need to clear the road in case there is an incident, um, obviously we're, uh, the fire risk isn't what we're too concerned about at this moment with all the rain that's happening. But you do have a lot of hikers, a lot of bikers that we have a lot of medical assist calls that the fire department responds to up there. So it's a matter of uh, getting, you know, clearing it to the type, to the, to the degree where we can still get uh, the utility truck or vehicles through there. Uh, but through the MWPA and actually through their core funding, um, through a very uh, well-written application and request by Quinn Gardner, who's the emergency manager for Center Fell, um, is addressing all of the fire roads in what's known as the San Rafael zone, which is the zone that we're in, uh, where they're going to be going through and pulling some vegetation back and uh, making sure not only from a fire hazard standpoint, but just from an accessibility mm -hmm. standpoint, so that all of that can be done properly. And that's actually going to be funded through the MWPA core funds directly. So they will be taking on that project and all of the uh, associated work with it, which will be great. Um, and that will certainly help. But in the meantime, you know, trees come down and the MWPA isn't always able to react as quickly as we can to make sure that we still have access because you certainly don't want to find a situation where somebody is down and we can't get emergency responders up there because there's a tree across the road and that slows any sort of progress. So it's, sometimes it's just a matter of us clearing it enough so that emergency vehicles can get through. Okay, thank you. I actually have a couple questions. Um, one, Chief, uh, when we were talking about the Lassen fire previously, um, we talked about, um, I want to say we talked about um, the middle school and it being an evacuate, like if, if we were to have the kids at school, let's say the fire was in the middle of the day. And I think you mentioned that there was going to be discussion that was going to follow that um, this this gets me on the other side too, because I work at that middle school and that was part of a meeting I was in is what would happen if, and I was like, oh, well, I was at this meeting and I think there's going to be some discussion, you know, on a countywide level. Is that, is that continue? I mean, obviously it probably is, but do you have any timeline or any insight into how <clears throat> that's going to continue? You know, I, um, I need to follow up with Captain Papa Nicola. I was at the station last week, but Captain Brackett was there. I want to follow up with Captain Papa Nicola to find out first about, the internal after action review and what came from that. And then usually after you do an internal one, you do the, the more expanded version. So um, I'm, my assumption is that something should be pending pretty soon. You don't want to let too much time elapse before you have that, um, that information is fresh in everyone's mind and those conversations take place. And so given that there may already be something scheduled, I just don't know with certainty on that, but sure. I can certainly loop back to you and find out. Okay. That would be great. Thank you so much. And Absolutely. Eric, just kind of in that same vein, you mentioned that that Marinwood doesn't own like that hillside that sort of comes by the parking lot of the middle school that Marinwood doesn't own that. Is that owned by the school district then? I know there's a weird kind of property. No, we on own portions of it. Um, there's also portions of that hill that are owned. Uh, in fact, a large parcel is owned by the church at the top of Ellen Court. Okay. That uh, comes down the backside almost the entire way to the creek. Um, the school district does own part of that property. It's part of that same parcel. So it does get a little 
confusing. There's not necessarily oh, sure. uh, property boundary lines that right. are up there. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but no, no, no. You, yeah, it, there, there's multiple parties that right. own a piece of that hill. It does. I'm just, you know, in my unique situation, I'm just wondering how I can help, you know, make some, like we're doing a great job. It seems like in a lot of other parks, like where the open space, you know, the, I think what most of us consider the traditional open space going up to the hills, but that's like this one spot right in the middle that could Do cause a geo ping, problem. Right. Like pin yourself <laughs> and then send Eric the coordinates. The oh, Eric knows where I am all the time. Uh-huh. Um, but no, I just wondered, like, because I know when we had that Lassen fire, some of the consideration from people on the eastern side of Las Galinas and those small neighborhoods that then butt up against what is now becoming a, a new residences, but there's also a lot of open space over there, mm-hmm. was what happens if the embers blow from where they were in the Lassen fire, they, they find a home in that middle zone right and then it starts that fire right next to the school which then would continue to blow to the other side i think was the concern of some residents that i had heard and i was just just trying to sort out all the details yeah and the chief can speak to this a lot more intelligently than i can but i can say that's also part of what is being uh, analyzed and looked at through the zone haven platform that uh, actually chief white was very responsible towards bringing into this much larger countywide study um, and looking at evacuation models and so on and so forth, scenarios, what could happen. Right. So I'm sure that there is more information coming on that as well as uh, people who are much more educated and trained than I am in looking at it, uh, you know, come up with, with various solutions. Uh, but uh, keeping in mind, Chris, this is a, a countywide effort too. So, oh, completely, uh, completely. It'll, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll take them time, but yeah, that, that, sure. I, I believe that's all part of it. Okay, cool. And, and I don't expect anybody to have the answers. I'm just raising the questions that come to me. Um, My other question is a much easier one. Do we offer, I know for a while in the main parking lot at Marinwood, we had a sandbag station. I haven't like been by there in a couple of weeks. Do we have that? Is that somewhere else or is there a plan to have it? Just knowing that we're expecting hopefully a lot more rain. And I do know that we had some, not streetwide flooding, but I know we had some people with issues in their yards and things like that. Luke, do you want that? Uh, or you want me to run? Um, yeah, no, I can I can answer that one. Yeah, we do um, plan on uh, resuming offering sand and sandbags. Um, we usually wait a little bit into the after the first um, rains, as uh, we don't tend to see much flooding this early in the season, as the ground is you know absorbing a lot of the water. Right. Um, but we yeah we will be uh, putting sand out in sandbags um, you know a, a little later into the wet season, and we'll be announcing that and letting people know. Okay. Do you anticipate, yeah. Luke, that that would be in the same part of the parking lot then, just so I can kind of report back to a few people? Um, yes, most likely. Okay, makes sense. Thank you both very much. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Yeah, Absolutely. and Chris, the other thing I would follow up on that is, you know, directly from the Emergency Operations Center, um, if you go to the website, I believe it's emergency.marincounty.org, they actually have a list of locations. Um, right now, this early in the season, what they're primarily doing is pointing people towards uh, retail locations right. where you can find those because most of the agencies and cities and towns haven't set these up yet, typically don't until later. People who know that they have uh, particular flooding issues uh, specific to their resident uh, if they go to this website they can find you know which places sell where they can get this at a, right. at a retail level and they can be you know and most of these are meant for uh, at the agency level when you have widespread flooding and okay. Uh, extreme rain okay thank you all very yep, much but the information's it. there cool thank you you're welcome any other questions from the public uh, yeah, one second. Hi, Steven. Chief. Hi, Chief. Welcome back. Okay. Um, sorry I missed you last month. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I, and I know you were gone uh, during the last and fire. Um, I had requested uh, uh, a more detailed written report, um, and I'm glad we have part of that report. Um, available this month but um you know one of the i I think we have a opportunity to learn from what we did right and what we did wrong um and um to echo 
Chris's concerns regarding evacuations, I think the public uh, was kind of caught off guard. We've all been talked to, we've been talking about disaster preparedness forever, but you know when the uh, push comes to shove, ha half of us evacuated, half of us watched the fire. Um, all of us realized that we weren't as re prepared as we thought we could be. Um, the um, the radios uh, did not uh, go off and, and warn the residents. I got a text message saying that there was a fire on Mount Lassen, and my first response for a number of minutes was, oh, Northern California is having a bad fire. Isn't that bad? My, my in-laws live up in, in that area. I had no idea that it was just um, a short distance from my house. So there was some communication issues. There was some um, uh, people didn't know where to evacuate to. Um, and I, I just think that, that we're missing out on a really great opportunity to help uh, the public be prepared in the event of another emergency. Um, from my knowledge, the last time we had an emergency, a fire emergency um, this big was in the 1970s. That's uh, 45 years ago. Um, and where I guess that whole hill burnt up and, and came down near the houses. This was close. Um, I think the fire department, uh, especially Cal Fire and all, all that equipment, made short work of this, and, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the leadership uh, in uh, the fire department, but I, I think we're we're not quite covering everything we could cover uh, to protect life in our community, um, because that's uh, of course that's our, our biggest concern, right? Not 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 the building, but getting the people out of the way. Um, so I would hope that there would be a more detailed report. Now, one other thing, um, several months ago, I, it was right before the 4th of July holiday, I learned in, from a, a news report in the paper that a um, uh, half mile from our firehouse, um, uh, a deer struck a motorcyclist and the motorcyclist was killed. We never found out about who responded to it, what, what happened in that incident. We were, we were promised some uh, kind of follow up on that, but we never received it. So I guess I, I guess I'd like to, uh, you know, learn from the good things that you do from our, our for our, our community chief and uh, uh, have a little bit more detail so we all can be a little better prepared. Um, that's really all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I will offer that. Um, much like is the case in many communities, there's always room for improvement for everyone in the way of preparedness. And you acknowledge that, you know, not everyone was as prepared as they thought they were. And that, that's often the case, um, no matter which community you go to, that, you know, people realize, uh, oh, my go bag isn't quite what it should have been, or my, my rations that I put aside are actually expired and need to be, you know, discarded and replaced, or my water or my generator hasn't been, you know, started. Um, I don't have backup fuel. I mean, any number of things in the way of preparedness. When it comes to um, alerts and notifications, I would encourage you to sign up for Nixle. Just specifically look at getting information through your, your community, not necessarily signing up in other communities elsewhere, because uh, if you've you made an assumption that you were receiving a text about some place in Northern California, that's kind of unlikely in the event you haven't signed up in that community, you shouldn't be receiving notifications, you know, in a distant location. So I would certainly pay close attention to anything I would receive in the way of communications and ensure that it's not something that you should be paying close attention to uh, within your own community or adjacent community. Uh, but know your, know your zone. That's the new uh, mantra from zonehaven.com, know your zone. So you have an opportunity go and just check it out and see what they offer in the way of what zone are you in and if there's information being pushed to the incident commander or to from the incident commander to the office of emergency services there will be information pushed out to the community through a variety of sources to ensure everyone knows that there's an evacuation warning or an evacuation order 
um, that could uh, uh, impact you and or your neighbors. And so with that, know, knowing your zone becomes very important and it'll help you understand, you know, generally which directions you can leave safely. Um, know, know your, uh, excuse me, I've spoke to Zone Haven in the past, uh, collaborating with Waze. That application provides you information that Zone Haven itself couldn't give you right at this point in time. But Waze will be able to tell you which direction to travel in, which is based on the situation. So I would just, I would go back and try to, you know, review some information from um, Fire Safe Marin, they have really good information on that site and also look at zonehaven.com so you can be a little more uh, informed about am I going east or west on Lucas Valley Road? Am I going to Las Gainas or am I, you know, heading in a different direction altogether? There's the, the great thing about Marin Wood is there's not a lot of place to get confused about which directions you may be able to go in and, and find some safe refuge or, or safe route of travel. Um, but to that point, I, I will say that, you know, as, as a fire service agency, there's always room for improvement, um, whether we openly admit that or not. Uh, we're all in a, in, a, in a place of trying to learn more and trying to um, share information and or improve our circumstances as an agency, as first responders, and as a community. So your point's well taken. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Is there, there is another... Uh, yeah, there is, Bill. Uh, one second, please. Uh, Michael. Michael, can you hear us? Hello. Okay. All right, Michael, I, uh, you're up. If you're there, I don't show you as muted. He might be having some technical difficulties, so hopefully we can get back to him. Hmm. Okay. Maybe he can put something in the chat to let you know. Yeah, we don't have a, a chat. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Because we have nobody to monitor it. Okay, well. I guess not. Yeah, I can try them one more time. One second here. While we're waiting, maybe I'll open another can of worms. Great. What about the fire that happened on the other side of the ridge? Do we know what started that? Michael Bennett. Oh, he just sent me a like note said his computer crashed. So hopefully we get him back. So it was There's like two a week. What? There's two Michaels now. Uh, let me try this one. One second. Michael, are you there? Hi. Yeah, hi. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Welcome. <laughs> so I just had a comment on the um, the like test along the Queenstone and um, the times that it would take to get to the points um, kind of further um, further east or further west. Um, I was wondering if like a similar test had been done, like going through Louise um, fire road, um, it seems like that would be a faster access point, even if it's not necessarily on Marin Woods property. Um, but it would just be interesting to get a comparison um, if the Marin Wood engine um, would be called over there. That's it. Um, I, I would I would offer that perhaps um, depending on where the fire is located, we wouldn't want to eliminate any option. Um, but given the location of this fire, I think uh, we certainly use the the most expedited route of travel. The the from what I can tell by the map, the the Louise Fire Road is quite a bit of ways away and would have led to a substantial delay. Now given Let's say the units were already out at you know some far west remote location, and maybe they thought maybe this is going to be a quick route of travel or access for them. I could see them maybe considering it at that point. But one of the things we want to do is we want to anchor a fire, and traveling that road would actually put us probably at the head of the fire or on a flank of the fire, as opposed to 
at a point where we would figure we could anchor and move forward to both get a left and or a right flank established to contain the fire. So while Luis might be a good road for another incident, I just, I would say that given this distance away from the incident, um, I wouldn't necessarily want to consider that as a, a route unless there were some other units that were already traveling in the area and we just told them to, to take this road to help provide a, a supplement on the left flank or the head or something like that. Yeah, and Chief, I also don't want to speak entirely out of line um, because I'm not entirely sure I'm correct here, but I don't know that Louise Fire Road is actually uh, capable for apparatus beyond, you know, utility trucks and uh, basic four-wheel drives. I'm not sure that it's uh, it's uh, maintained well enough to move uh, apparatus such as a Type 3 up there, uh, up the road. So, um, and I know that's a county-maintained fire road too. And I think a lot of these that, you know, are still called fire roads aren't necessarily active fire roads anymore uh, with Queenstone and then Big Rock being kind of the primary entrances to that area as well as uh, I believe there's some entrances on the Novato side as well. Can I just add that I, I think in our meeting we also mentioned how sometimes steep they are too so yeah incline may not look as steep on a map. Um, right. Yeah, and I can follow up with our uh, with our fire engineers as well and see if I can get some better uh, on that one too. The future. And then can I just add one more thing for Luke? I found out where um, Creekside Drive is. Just want to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm done. Any other comments from the public? No. Uh, nope. Chief? I really appreciate it. Thank you very much again. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Everyone have a great night and stay safe and warm. You got Thank it. Thank you. And, and don't forget to call the chief. pediatrician. Yeah. I will. I, I I, like, seriously, to. though, because we, I didn't even bother trying to get any appointments. I just called the pediatrician's office. We're going on Thursday. Oh, that's so great. some pediatrician offices are getting the vaccine and some are sending you off to the big vaccination. But there are walk ins, but at the end of the day. Oh, I see. Well, end of the day actually works for you if I can pull it off tomorrow, but we'll see. So okay. thank you again for that. I appreciate it. And good night to all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. We'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thanks. On to park and recreation matters. Draft minutes of the park and recreation. We're going to review. Yeah, and in the same notion uh, that Kathleen did, Lisa Ruggieri is the liaison for the board to the Park and Rec Commission. So I'm going to uh, put it over to her if she can just kind of recap briefly. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Eric. Um, Thank you. So this, this um, I thought this was a great meeting. Um, and uh, just one of the main items of note which um, came out of this meeting was the... Um, the Marinwood Play Structure Replacement Project. Um, we reviewed um, a draft of a community survey. Um, Commissioner Fine had presented the commission with this preliminary survey um, to ultimately be shared with the community to socialize the upcoming adjustments to the play structure and to garner feedback surrounding items of priority. Um, the survey is structured to gather both qualitative and quantitative results. Um, we discussed ways in which the survey's um, existence could be socialized, um, specifically um, perhaps on the, the billboard going down Lucas Valley Road, um, of course, with um, signage as well along the play, the play structure um, so that people, so the community is aware that the survey exists and can enter their feedback into it. Um, and there was also discussion of the inclusion of demographic data to, um, to the survey to further ensure transparency with regard to which age groups would prefer which components. Um, as an example, you know, a family with a four-year-old and a two-year-old may seek a different, um, different elements than a family with an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. So, you know, kind of find, looking for a way to potentially include that um, so we can have that stratification. Um, and, you know, once that survey comes out, it should, um, it should provide some really interesting um, data points as we're looking at um, how we're going to be augmenting the play structures as we move forward. Um, 
that was the the the, the main takeaway from me um, just as far as um, uh, agenda items that are listed here um, and then of course um, we and we've discussed this prior in in this board meeting tonight um, uh, Erica informed the commission about the uh, pre preliminary trail fe feasibility study and kind of how that the that's not quite underway but we're you know making traction towards getting that to be underway um so that's that's all i've got i mean i don't know if i luke eric there's anything that i missed that you would like to fill in no i think the survey was the primary discussion point for that day so that was good thank you sure and where are we with the funding for that right we were getting a grant did yep. we get uh, yeah same place that we always were uh, okay. yeah we've all, all that all that's rolling as well was there how how do we usually get the surveys out i mean you mentioned some signage lisa but i was just curious mm -hmm. traditionally how that gets rolled out just so we can get a huge response right so it's well it's a survey it's through survey monkey mm -hmm. um and so my understanding is some Member at the at the Maroon Community Center, um, we can sort of blast it out to that population, um, and then for those that aren't in that database, and someone correct me if I'm incorrect here, um, for those that aren't in that database, um, we can socialize via via signage and our um, social media outlets as well. Great. Yeah, um, yeah, you kind of froze up on us a little bit there. For right, a no, I think I, I got the gist of it but, for sure. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. this, just for me, this jumps to mind, like you know, creating a QR code and having, you know, even like little lawn signs near some of the focal points, you know, like by the tennis courts, by the actual play structure itself, by the mini park, where people who are actively playing in that park could be like, bang, hit that QR code, and you know, respond right there would seem to be a good way to do it as well. Yeah. All of those ideas yeah. uh, were QR codes were, were brought up. Yes, perfect. <laughs> we're all on the same page. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Public. Yeah. One second. Stephen. Uh, yes. Uh, Thanks, uh, Lisa, for your report. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm going to make the same comment uh, I, I did with the fire department uh, or fire commission. You know, why aren't we recording these um, meetings? Uh, it's really easy to do. Uh, this is a public agency, and um, I don't see anything that people are doing wrong. It's just that um, it gives context to what is being said. Um, and the concerns of our commissioners. Um, having people serve and talk among themselves is not really public representation. That's, that's, um, that's ruling by basically decree. Um, and I, I think we can do better than that. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, the parks are, to me, uh, my favorite uh, part of uh, Marinwood CSD, and um, I would really like other people to know uh, the the issues of concern with the, the Parks Department. Um, and I did want to say something. I, unfortunately, uh, I did not have a chance to uh, respond to Chief White. Um, he missed my point entirely. You know, um, I wasn't really critiquing the fire department. I, my uh, point was that we really should try to learn as much as we can from um, the Mount Lassen fire and improve our communications, improve our preparedness in the community. Um, I think that is really ultimately what, what we want to do. I think he took uh, a defensive uh, uh, it, he was defensive, um, but he shouldn't have been, uh, you know, when I made the comment about Mount fire on Mount Lassen. Well, you know, that was a communication issue. If the uh, announcement had gone on fire on Mount Lassen court in, Mar you know, Marinwood Lucas Valley, 
that would immediately have alerted me and, and maybe other people who might have been confused by the first message. So items like that, if you don't capture um, some of these uh, issues that we had, they're just kind of lost to posterity. I, I, I think we want to be prepared next time. You know, let's not uh, be in the same situation that Napa and uh, Sonoma was a few years ago. Um, it, it could easily happen here. Let's hope not. But uh, anyhow, um, thank you very much for the, the report, Lisa. Thank you, Stephen. On to uh, an appointment of Park and Rec Commissioners. Yeah, the same process as for the Fire Commission. These are all for two-year terms, all beginning on January 1st. Uh, we have two current commissioners who are seeking reappointment in John Campo and Ian Fine. And then we have a new member of the community, Michael Banesh, who actually spoke earlier uh, mm -hmm. in the meeting. Who was also seeking appointment and he kind of found us and found the commission before I even started putting out any announcements and he's actually uh, uh, paid attention to the last couple of meetings and joined and participated is uh, what I mean. So, and my recommendation Michael Banesh and my apologies if I'm not pronouncing that. Eric you're going in and out. Right. Sorry um, probably because I'm looking away. Um, uh, my recommendation is to appoint Michael uh, Banesh, uh, Ian Fine, and John Campo, um, two seats uh, for two-year terms expiring December 2023. Great. Can I get a motion? I motion to appoint Michael Bench and Banesh and to reappoint Ian Fine and John Campo to the regular seats on the Park and Recreation Commission for a two-year term expiring December 2023 and to leave the alternate commissioner seat vacant. Second that. Yay. Uh, any comments? Uh, yeah, one, one second. second. I'm gonna... Michael. I, I, I just wanted, wanted to, to say, um, I'm, I'm looking, looking forward, forward to, to working with everyone, everyone uh, in serving, serving our community. community. We look forward to having, having you. you. Thanks. Thanks for, for, for offering. offering. <laughs> for, for clarification, am I, am I pronouncing your last name correctly, Michael? Is it Banesh? Uh, Banesh. Banesh. Got it. My apologies. Thank you. I have one of those names that nobody can ever pronounce correctly upon first name either. So don't take it personally, please. I know. I'm just doing that one. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll just say, Michael, uh, I'm so appreciate you stepping into the ring and also just giving us a really nice rundown of um, who you are and your interest in your letter. It's fantastic. It was, um, it was nice to read that over before uh, meeting you tonight. So thank you very much. Then you have another comment as well, Bill. Uh, okay. One second, please. Stephen. I just wanted to say I'm real excited about uh, Michael being on the commission. Uh, you know, the Jewish Community Center is, uh, I think, a wonderful, wonderful program. So I, I'm hoping that he can uh, lend perspective um, and lessons learned from the Jewish Community Center for our rec department, especially in the area of marketing. Um, I, I think it's just a wonderful thing now we've got uh, John Campo we've got some really good people on our parks and rec commission and you know hopefully we can you know make beautiful beautiful things happen more beautiful things happen thanks thank, thank you Stephen Tiffany can we get a vote Thank board president Please. Shay aye director case aye Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Thank you all. Awesome. On to the uh, <clears throat> Park and Rec Maintenance Activity Report. That would bring Luke into the picture, I believe. Thank you, Bill. Uh, <clears throat> can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep, great. 
Um, so this last month, the recreation staff has been uh, working, planning our upcoming events, classes and programs uh, for the winter and spring and even the summer. Um, believe it or not, we, we talk about uh, our summer season all year round and it's a big, um, big part of our year is, is working out what we're going to do next year, analyzing what, what went well and what we need to improve on from the previous year. So that's a constant conversation and there's been lots of plans being made. Um, we just had our um, fall art show uh, took place on Saturday, and um, those are first in-person art show we've had. We've been able to have since uh, 2019 um, due to fires and, and then due to um, COVID, and it was wonderful to to be back having a, a community event at the community center again. And um, it was a great show. Susan Press once again organized uh, the show and. Um, it was uh, a lot of beautiful and interesting artwork from a lot of Marin's um, uh, finest and veteran artists. And uh, it was our, our most well-attended art show that we've had so far. We've been um, having art shows here in Marinwood for the last nine years, and this is by far our best turnout. And so um, I think people were excited to uh, just get out of the house and come to something, uh, a community event, but also um, the show has grown in popularity um, each time we've done it. So that was um, a really nice uh, event and, and went, went really well. And um, uh, so we're excited about that. Our next special event will be, um, uh, we're not going to be putting on our traditional Winterfest uh, open house kids event. Um, we're going to try to do something a little bit more uh, COVID friendly this year and we're going to be um, uh, hoping to hold an outdoor sort of winter concert um, weather permitting and we've got a lot of uh, plans we're making for that. We will still be offering um, the photos with Santa and we'll have some kids activities and uh, we're working right now on our contingency plan if it's raining so um, but that'll be a really really fun event and we've got some great things in store. Is it Which going to be, be like announcing. a cross between the Winterfest and music in the park? I'm not going to call it that, but uh, it'll have elements of, of uh, both of those things. Yay! So we'll, we'll be announcing some of the details uh, pretty soon. We're just finalizing some things uh, this week and next week. But we're really excited to kind of do something new, um, uh, both to try to keep people uh, safe and, and uh, just to kind of change it up a little bit. So uh, those plans are underway. We'll be offering winter break camp again during the, the school break, um, which, which we're looking forward to. Um, and staff continue on uh, to oversee, to market and manage our, um, our offering of, of recreation classes uh, that, we're, that we're currently doing. Um, so that's been going great. The other thing I wanted to discuss on the recreation side, I did include um, our, finally got our summer numbers compiled. Uh, to show you, and I did include uh, a spreadsheet um, showing our totals for the, the pool season um, revenue and expenditures, as well as our summer camp revenue expenditures. And that's on the last page of the, uh, oh yeah, Eric's kinda got the, the report up on the screen now. Thank you, Eric. And, and typically for this report, we, we usually look at the, the year prior and the most recent uh, season to kind of give, you know, just kind of see where we're at in comparison. But um, uh, the year prior was very strange and, and uh, unique due to all of the COVID restrictions and, and all, all of our things being very limited. So I didn't think that gave us much context. Uh, it didn't make sense to just show you 2020 and 2021. So I decided to add in uh, a couple prior years. So you could see like 2018 and 2019 were more typical Marinwood um, summers uh, or pool seasons and summer programs. And so you can kind of see um, kind of the trend for what, what we were doing with, with, with the COVID uh, very severely restricted summer in 2020, as well as um, us moving a little bit closer to, to a normal season uh, this year. So um, overall, we, we actually ended up running uh, larger and more programs than we uh, initially planned for and budgeted for. Um, going into the planning season, uh, we thought things were going to be much more limited, and, and they were much more limited in terms of the health guidance that we were following. And as summer approached, we uh, a lot of things were relaxed, and we had the um, ability to uh, increase our enrollment for camps, uh, increase our programming at the pool. And so we ended up doing that um, as quickly and, and to the best of our abilities. So uh, looking uh, down, if I could just go down to the summer camps, I'll start there. Uh, 
so it's a little bit more digestible. But um, just a couple of notes. I'm not going to walk through this whole spreadsheet. I, if you guys have questions about different line items, I'd be happy to, to answer those. But um, I'll just say that our summer camp, uh, this summer, 2021, we were operating at about 60% of our of the enrollment that we were taking in 2019. And, um, and so staffing was similarly uh, decreased because of that, but it's not an exact apples to apples for that. Um, in 2020, we were, we were limited by uh, health guidelines and we were limited to about 30% of our, our summer camp enrollment. And we, and we were maxed out for all of the camps on all the weeks, what we were allowed to take. Um, and the number of things that, that we typically offer, um, but we were able to increase that this summer. So that's kind of just giving you a little bit of um, sense of, of the change in, in the numbers there. Um, and then with the pool season, you can see we, we uh, the, the middle turquoise section of this spreadsheet is, is looking at aquatics revenue and expenditures. And that's the, um, the programs that we run, such as swim lessons, lifeguard training and our guards and training camp that all uh, goes into the aquatics line. Um, and as you can see in 2020, we didn't really run, we weren't really able to run much of anything uh, in that category. And, um, and this year we were able to get, um, start offering uh, a lot more swim lessons, but we kept things private and our programs were all um, smaller than we would, they would run in a normal season. Um, but then moving on up to our, our pool revenue, which is, uh, basically our lap swim and our recreation swim attendance. Um, we, we had, we actually had quite a lot of um, reservations for those programs this year. And um, things were actually, we, we pretty much maxed out what we were allowed to do at the pool this year as best we could use utilizing the pool at all times of the day for, um, for all of our different programs. So this is sort of just a, a a uh, snapshot um, that we use internally to kind of track um, how things are going year to year and, and you know, for us to use, but uh, I feel like I share that with you guys just to sort of show you where, where we're at for a summer season. Um, the fact that the budget, uh, the budget year, the, the fiscal year kind of straddles the middle of our summer season a little bit, um, it can be tricky to kind of make sense of it. So we use uh, a couple different things to try to look at summer as a whole. And this is one of those uh, tools we use. So if, um, no one has any questions about this before I get into the parks and maintenance section. I'd be happy to answer those. I I have one, of course, tonight. Um, for the camp lunch reimbursement, is that the lunches for Marinwood? Um, the, so the camp, yes. Yeah, so we uh, offer uh, the option for camp parents to purchase lunches online that are from from Marinwood Market, and they get delivered. Uh, or we pick them up and, and distribute them to the campers. So it's just like a, a service that we provide. And the um, online company that we use to facilitate that, the, the parents pay directly through online and then they pay us um, a cut for, you know, for utilizing their service. And so that's, that's that number in the camp lunch reimbursement is the money we're getting from the company are, is like our percentage that we get back um, when all that's processed. Oh, okay. And then you said... It was at 60%, but we also increased, I believe the costs were more. So even though that number bumped all the way back up, we may not, well, hopefully we'll get back to the 2019 numbers this coming year, but we'll see, right? Because the um, prices yeah, I can't, go... I can't predict exactly what attendance is gonna look like going into, into 2022, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll have a better idea when we kind of, um, you know, get closer to the, to when we open up the camp registration, how many camps we're going to be offering and, and sort of the details. If on we're going to be able to do program. like the specialty ones and do we have to do two weeks or one week um, sessions? Those exactly. Yeah. So I, I can't speak to exactly what uh, okay. 20, the next summer is going to look like yet. We're, we're still working out a lot of those details, but um, in the, you know, in the coming months, we'll, we'll be able to make some of those announcements. I'm just trying to like see where you're going. Do you know what I mean? Um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anybody else? That's um, really just, good, though. In terms of the Sivan's question, yeah, I mean, um, we do expect that we would be uh, looking at, at revenue and um, attendance much closer to the 2000, 2018, 2019 numbers than, than the last two um, going yeah. in next summer. So. But it looks really good, especially considering how limited it was last year and how unsure it was going in this year 
Um, you guys did an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you for keeping costs down and also making it unbelievably fun for the kids. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I, I want to thank Robin and John Paul and Carolyn for um, all their amazing hard work and helping us, you know, pivot uh, to be able to, to adapt as, as guidelines changed and we we're able to, you know, increase programs and offer things that, um, that we, we hadn't, you know, been planning to offer necessarily and, and we were able to kind of get things going pr pretty quickly, which um, they worked really hard to make that happen and, and really happy about that. So big thanks to them. Cool. Um, anything else on the on the summer numbers? I, I uh, before I move on. Well, on the um, parks maintenance side of things, uh, the storms have definitely been a big uh, part of the routine lately. So um, we we have a lot of uh, storm drains, culverts, and V ditches throughout the district that staff uh, monitors closely when we have uh, a lot of rainfall. Um, a lot of these are uh, old. A lot of them. Um, do end up getting getting clogged up at times and we, we try to keep those clear and watch for um, anything that's overflowing or flooding. Um, they also keep a close eye on the creek, watching out for um, debris that's come down and, and gotten stuck and maybe be a, a posing a threat for, for causing a dam or causing flooding. And the, we clear things as needed, um, as well as keeping an eye on the, the buildings, the roof and other um, areas of the um, community center to make sure things are okay. So they make their rounds every day, checking everything out. And we, um, we walk the Creek um, uh, fairly often, just keep keeping an eye on how everything's going. Everything's flowing great right now. Um, I, I think that the rush of water that we got in that huge storm initially um, washed pretty much everything out of the Creek that, that if we'd had a slower uh, start to the rainy season, things might've built up on, on our end of things, but it just kind of took it all away. And, and the, Creek is flowing great right now. We haven't had um, too, too much to, to, to deal with. We have had to remove some fallen trees and a few areas where things were building up, but um, so far so good. So we're hoping that that uh, continues to be the case this rainy season. Um, the uh, staff's also been working. They, they were helping get things cleaned up and, and prepared for the art show. Um, and we'll have some uh, changes we're making to the grounds in preparation for this, for this winter concert that we'll be hosting. Um, among other things. And I just want to say that, uh, oops, did, I, did you just lose me or am I still here? Okay, there we go. Um, staff have uh, been very excited uh, to see the progress at the parks, main, the new parks maintenance facility. It's been great. Um, our little makeshift work area is just, you know, down the driveway a bit from that shop. And it's just been fantastic and, and exciting to see things rising and the walls coming up and the roof going on. And, um, and I know the, the crew is, is just really, really looking forward to moving in and, and having a much better um, workspace. So um, they're, they're ecstatic uh, at this point. So um, that's been a, a nice thing to be able to kind of see that, see that progress each day as we're, as we're going over there. Um, and at this point, I'd be happy to, to take any questions. Yes, Sivan. Anybody? So, I'm not, I don't count today, Bill. I said anybody. <laughs> um, so you said that everything's flowing well. Do we have any more issue with erosion? Because it was um, such yes. a quick thing. And then with the pool, the top pool. How is that spot that was having erosion issues last year? Yeah, I can speak to that. The um, the there definitely the creek continues to do what it does, and it is the areas that are um, bereft of of tree roots and trees holding the bank. There are areas that have just just loose soil continue to get um, slowly eaten away, and there are a couple of areas that. Uh, we continue to monitor closely that are close to some of our buildings and, and some in our park that we've had um, some, you know, we lost some earth in, in previous seasons. Um, so that, that is continuing. We haven't seen, we haven't had any major incidents, um, but it's definitely something that we're keeping an eye on and, and the area by the, the top pool um, is holding. It hasn't gotten, gotten worse, but, um, you know, the season's pretty early. So we are uh, monitoring things closely and we, and we have um, been doing a lot of uh, planning and, and research for going into this next, um, this next year. Mid-February is uh, about the time when um, it's most appropriate and um, to, to do 
I guess erosion abatement plantings and, and addressing that. So we've got we've got plans to to kind of hit these areas um, full on with uh, with a few different approaches come the new year. And so, but in the meantime, there's not much we can do for that stuff during while the creek is flowing so heavily. Um, anything we do now would just wash away. So um, we're mostly just monitoring and crossing our fingers for some of those things, and then we'll we'll be addressing a lot of that uh, very seriously in, in the new year. Thanks. Luke, do you know, does San Rafael, I'm assuming it's the city of San Rafael, but I don't, maybe it's Marin County, the, the part of the creek that is just um, south of us, like literally on the other side of Lucas Valley Road, um, I happen to walk that, you know, a few times in the last couple of weeks and notice there's a lot of natural and non-natural debris that if it's not cleared by them, it's obviously going to end up in our end. Do you know, do you ever have any communication with them or? Uh, I mean, we, it's, stuff does, yeah. I mean, I know you're talking about like on the other side of, uh, of, of Lewis Valley from the community center. Yeah, kind of yeah like exactly. over there. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, we, we do hear from, from the county and from San Rafael from time to time about various things, but everyone sort of keeps track of their own property, I would say right. for the most part. Um, and things just sort of, you know, if, if something gets caught up on our end, we, we, we address it. And if it makes it through down to some, you know, it just coming out, we, we sort of can only keep track of so much of the Creek and we have a lot of Creek on our property. Right. So, um, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about and that, that area is, ha hasn't po posed an issue for, for anything on our end so okay. far. Okay. Um, and I do, uh, I will report out that the Oleander that I was asking about next to the, the tennis courts closest to Miller Creek middle school got completely taken down um by uh by the uh, miller creek school district uh staff and we have a brand new maintenance person i don't know if you guys have any interest in meaning that we have a brand new head of maintenance that obviously since we have that piece of property that kind of is a the tweener property if you guys want me to create an in in like a, a digital introduction i'd be happy to do so oh yeah that'd be great we would love that um yeah you're talking about the oleander on the uh, against the tennis court like fences yes oh yeah no our guys did that um oh they did yeah that was us that, we, that happened this week with oh that's staff. hilarious because i had just put in i was told to put in a work order that that was miller creek school district yeah i mean it is it's on school property the tennis courts we maintain and right and you know so it's one of those things where it's sort of a shared sort of situation but um <laughs> Yeah, all right, we, we, yeah, we dealt with that one. Perfect. Hey, tell the guys they did a great job. I yeah, mean, we still need to remove the, the cuttings uh, once they dry up a little bit, but we'll, right. we'll get those out of there soon. But, Perfect. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I'm still, I'm sure that the new maintenance guy is still amazing, Chris. I'm sure he's <laughs> I, I don't think it had anything to do with him as much as it had to do with, <laughs> I thought it was our guys uh, on the other side. All right, yeah. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to rattle a cage over there. Yeah. yeah Please don't um, move that quickly on the Miller Creek. Campuses. It's, it's, so. it's, it's, yeah, it's on their side. Well, um, and I, I just, you know, our, our staff has always had a really great relationship with the um, schools, uh, the Miller Creek's maintenance department, and there's um, some great camaraderie there and shared resources. And I, I've um, been very impressed just that the relationship's been, been very good as, since I can tell. So um, I'm sure that'll continue with the new director. I'm, I'm, I'll be excited to, to, meet, um, to meet that person. Okay. And I will say I'm kind of friendly with the uh, maintenance guys on our side, and, and they say the same thing about Marinwood. They're always really impressed and happy to work with you guys. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. Um, I just want to add that I love the new grass. I know you guys call it turf. I call it grass, whatever. Um, right around the, the tennis courts, but the one or the closest one to the tennis courts, when is that coming down? Or are you guys keeping it up until the shed moves? Um, no, that will come down. That was an area that was uh, complete. A lot of that is completely brand new uh, seed and a lot of it is very young and just taking off. And um, this is a time of year when that uh, grass is very vulnerable to getting chopped up with dogs and foot traffic and the track yeah. team and everything. So um, we're, we're trying to give it a little bit more time to, to really take hold since so much of that side was completely bald. And so it's a lot of brand new, um, brand new sprouts coming up that, that aren't as robust. So um, ho nice. hopefully soon, but we just want to, we don't want to undo all the, all the work that just went into it by uh, having that get all churned up in the mud. Um, so uh, it, it will come down soon. I, I promise. Okay. Oh, I don't, I'm not in a rush, but thank you. Don't jump the fence and roll in the mud. 
But it's so nice and fluffy. Any other comments from the public? At one, one second, second. Bill. I, I wish I could have uh, had two shots at this, uh, like the directors, but I'll be quick. Um, I have two comments, one on uh, the revenue and uh, something else on health and safety. First on the revenue, um, I, I, I don't have anything specific on the revenue except to say that there's not enough information here to evaluate what's going on. We need attendance numbers. We also need to understand how many uh, residents and versus non-residents who are u utilizing our services. I'm a bit concerned that we're looking at the numbers and we're forgetting the fact that um, like for the lap swimmers, for example, we uh, increase the uh, cost for lap swimming 2,000 percent. That was, you know, so the revenue is is there, but you know, who's paying that revenue? Is is it outsiders? It's is it uh, residents? Why do we care about residents? Well, we're subsidizing the CSD. We're subsidizing the salaries and uh, and everything else, and so we do have a right to get a return on our investment. Um, with regards to health and safety, um, this is an ongoing concern. It's been discussed before, um, and uh, I, it's a little embarrassing. But uh, we've, you know, we've got a drinking and peeing problem in the park, and uh, and uh, we had talked about this several months ago. Um, the guys like to drink at the horseshoe pits and really create a. Um, basically, it's a, a frat party every Friday night and sometimes during the week, and there are no bathrooms. So they're going to the bathroom in the creek. They're, they're really, I think, not behaving like responsible men, um, and something needs to be done about it. Um, you need to step up. I know a couple of directors are down there regularly. I don't see them doing anything bad. Um, but you know, you know, we need to we, we need to be leaders in our community, and we also need to be responsible, and we need to follow the law. Um, there, there is no drinking in the park uh, by our, uh, I think, by county standards, and yet we're we're turning a blind eye to it. So I don't want to be a blue nose. I I don't mind people having a beer, but it's really gotten out of hand. Um, and at the very least, at the very, very least, we need to make toilets available so guys aren't peeing in the bushes. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's gross, actually, and it really does impact uh, some of our more sensitive members of the community that, who will not walk past there on a Friday night or, or when it really gets uh, rocking and rolling over there. So let's not spend our time thinking about um, how the the, uh, the soccer players from from the canal come up and they drink their more modellos and uh, call call them a problem when we have a problem of our own um, I, I don't know what's gonna what your plan is thank to address it but you really do need to address it and thank please you do Stephen. that and I would like to hear Thank you, Stephen. Anybody else, sir? Uh, no. Can I ask a quick question? Are the porta potties still by the tennis courts? There is a porta potty. Okay. So there are restrooms by the horseshoe pit. No, there is horseshoe, but the porta potty is on the other side of the creek on the other side of the tennis courts. So, it, but it's not that far to walk, right? Maybe for some people. I, I, I'm, I'm just putting it out there that there is a restroom closer than the community center. So we are providing a restroom that is close-ish, maybe not right at the horseshoe pit, but 
Yes, peeing in the park is not a good idea. Well, I would also want to add that we also don't monitor our rental, the people who come and rent the one section right outside the pool gate or other people who barbecue or decide to set up shop. So why would we monitor and regulate the horseshoe pit if we're not going to regulate everybody? And that's not my position on the board. So that's not what I'm here for. Sorry. I have other tasks to handle. Um, I think, I think the only thing I'd like to address um, from Stephen's comments, and maybe this happened before I joined the board, but Stephen, I have to say, I, I take offense to you saying that we're saying that we have trouble with a certain section of our population. You reference soccer players drinking potatoes. I think that's totally out of line. If that happened before I was on the board, um, then I would call the commissioners out on that. But certainly that has not happened since I've been on the board. And I think it's, it's not a great position for any of us to be, to be pointing out one group that um, just, I, I don't think needs to be pointed out at all. We could, uh, you know, you're also not supposed to have your dog off leash in certain parts of the park. And there's definitely dogs off leash in those parts of the park as well. Thank you all. Any other comments from y'all? Okay. Board member items of interest, request for future agenda items. I would actually be really interested in asking the park and rec department. There is that space that we always refer to as the um, fireman's picnic area. That is just, if you're walking the maintenance path, um, heading east. I think everybody um, knows what that is. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know what it's officially called. I, I just that's know that's always what it's been referred okay. to as. Um, there's a bunch of picnic tables in there. Um, I don't know, like, I'm just questioning that, like, from a, I'd, I would be interested to have the parks and rec department, since that seems to be their role, to look at that and to see how well that's being utilized. Um, if, like there's, I think the old barbecue is still in place there. There's an old drinking fountain. I don't know if it works. seems like we've got some things that are still exist there that maybe we don't want there anymore. Um, and then I, I question like, there's a, like a pretty large number of picnic tables in there. Is that the best use of those picnic tables or could they be um, outsourced to other parts of our, uh, you know, parks and open space? So just asking maybe the, the Park and Rec Commission to take a look at that. That's interesting, Chris, because do we even rent those picnic tables out like we do around the pool and the park? I, I guess that no. would be my, my question. I, I don't. They are available for rental, but you need to bring a porta potty. Right, Eric? <laughs> Like, I think that that's in the rental Wait, agreement. They are, <laughs> like, I'm, I just, I'm sorry. It's, yes. Can, it's, it's, can I just add that the tables are used? Like, there's people yes. who do park on Quiet Wood and walk, and they, you know, have a picnic there. Or I know that Stephen has posted, you know, that a small group gets together and they play music in there. So oh. it's definitely, that space is definitely utilized sometimes. I think that maybe... I agree. Having the part and ma the maintenance crew look at the barbecue or seeing if there's one another way to revamp it so then it is more inviting so people can use it because it is great to use during the summer when it's a, it's in the shade. Right. Yeah. And I'm not making a judgment on it. I'm just saying we have a space there that seems yeah. to have some some things that maybe are not utilized anymore that I don't know if it makes sense to remove them or I, no judgments. I'm just asking P and R yeah. to to take yeah. a look at it. Well, Luke is trying to say something, right? Oh, I, I would just, I'm yes, yeah, so I, I, I would be, um, be, I'd be more than happy to to give either the commission or the board or whatever, um, whatever you guys would deem appropriate, um, just a, a little bit of a background on that area, what our maintenance level is, what the usage is, and and sort of what the current status um, of that area is. Um, so I answer probably can answer a lot of these questions, but um, we don't need to do that now. But I'd, I'd be happy to do that in, in whatever. Maybe form. that's next time. What do you think, Chris? The, I, my, my understanding yeah. is don't we have to direct Park and Rec to do that and then they report back to us? No? Uh, I mean, we could, but... 
then we would direct part and park and maintenance or park and the right. commissioners. But I think with Luke just giving us detail, then we would have the action of, oh, what about blah, 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 blah. And then it would go to Lisa. Okay. Uh, so I guess what I'm asking for <laughs> is an update is, is a, an updated view of that. And are we using like, what are, what are some, what's like, our goal? Yeah. Yeah. What, like, how are we utilizing that? Oh. How could we be better utilizing it? And are there things there, like, again, coming at it from the standpoint of a middle school teacher where a lot of the middle school kids hang out over there, are there things over there that we don't necessarily need anymore that we could be removing that would make it a more natural space that would be more, uh, more enjoyable? And I do think about four years ago, they refurbished those picnic tables, right, Luke? I feel like when we were going around refurbishing all the picnic tables a couple years ago, they did those too. I mean, there's stuff being done out there, yeah. you know, periodically, um, so I mean, as, as needed. So we, we've done a lot of work out there over the years. Um, yeah. So for, ne for next month, it's obviously not a rush. I'm just trying to add some stuff yeah. to the agenda. Yeah. You filled the, the big bike hole that you used to ride down and ride back up. So, so anybody else nope um, how about from the public uh before we go there bill the one thing i will say is december is typically the month when we designate or uh, we when the board uh, nominates and designates a board president and board vice president for the upcoming uh, calendar year. So that takes effect starting in January. So that'll go on to the board agenda for next month as well. Okay. Change Okay. You ready for public now? Might as well. Okay. One second. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to address uh, Chris's comment. The first th thing about the uh, uh, Modelo, the, the soccer players who drink Modelo, that's actually a direct quote. I, I'm embarrassed and offended by it too. I was at the time. Um, you know, I, I, I bring that up. I, I just think that I, the, the whole idea here, Chris, is to raise our, our level of, of community awareness and, and the standards by which we live by. And, you know, getting drunk and peeing in the bushes we can we can fix this this is not a big deal it's a it's called a porta potty um, now with regards to the quiet wood um, uh, the, the park there the the grove of trees it is a wonderful place and I guess uh, you're unaware we, we did take out the uh, the big barbecue pit that they had for a number of years where people would build bonfires but pretty much all that exists there are you know small grills uh now and picnic tables and they do get filled up you do see big parties um as uh, kathleen mentioned i have a music group you know during this era of covid we don't have the indoor public spaces that we have so that is actually a very important area to uh, uh to have for the public to enjoy I walk past there every day, a couple times a day, and every time I walk past there, there's there's a group of people in there. Um, it's maybe not a picnic picnic spot, but it's a gathering spot. Um, I certainly have some ideas of how it could be improved, um, but to take uh, what is a utilized um, facility, uh, recreational uh, facility, uh, out is it would really be a, a tragedy and a loss to our community. Um, we have had uh, on Quietwood our, our block parties used to happen in there. They'll probably happen again in the future. Um, it's a uh, it's a it's a really nice spot, and it's a spot that if you live in Marinwood, you know not too many people who don't live in Marinwood know about it. So you know, let's keep not only keep it, but maybe think about improving it um, um, there, there's a lot of things we could do and yes we could rent it out it's, people have had weddings back there um, so uh, 
you know, uh, we can talk about some ideas that I've had, but uh, but uh, let's let's go forward. Let's 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 make this a better park, not a, mm -hmm. a, a worse park. Thank, Thank you, Stephen. Uh, if there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. I'll second. President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Next uh, board meeting is December 14th. Yay! Next month. <laughs> Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanks Thanksgiving and happy Hanukkah to those Thanks who so celebrate. Have a good night. Recording stopped. Bye. Bye. Bye.